Welcome everybody. Um, I think we have three wonderful curators here sitting together, three completely different persons in the middle, <laughs> in case you were wondering. The middle is the one from France, came over especially this evening to talk to you from Orléans. It's Abdelkader Damani, uh, the director actually of uh, the Centre Val de Loire, and he um, put this exhibition together. So definitely we want to know more about this. He's the architect among us. The other two are art historians. They actually invited him somehow. We will hear about this later. Um, the two curators of the Triennale itself. We have Michel de Wilde, who is actually um, curator of visual arts here in Bruges, um, head of the cultural centers here in Bruges. <laughs> And Till Holger um, Borgert, director of the Bruges Museums, art historian and specialized in, in so many things. <laughs> Some small things like Jan van Eyck, Hieronymus Bosch. <laughs> so three very, very different people. Um, I'm very happy to, um, if there's gaps in the talk, to fill them in. But I think I won't be talking that much. I give you a small secret, that's why I'm so happy to meet uh, Mr. Domani or Abdul Kader, I will call you Abdul Kader. Uh, this evening, I'm an architect myself. I have a small architectural practice foot in the Brabant in Antwerp. But I had my education in London for a while. I worked for Zahadid for a couple of years. This was end of the 90s. We were completely in the middle of this period. The drawings that you see hanging there, her beautiful design drawings, they were all surrounding me and this was actually the most exciting period in which we all believed that we could then really change the world with our designs as architects. Um, so there's this belief from the 90s, but in this exhibition, we're even going back to the 60s and also looking forward. Um, there's this one element, Liquid City, the main theme of the Triennale, which binds, I think, the three of you somehow together anyway. I tried to find this, Liquid City is your title. <laughs> This beautiful quote by Marcus Novak, he's actually one of the, yeah, of the thinkers, you might say, of the theoreticians, but then um, also designing architects who invented this kind of thoughts about digital architecture, about biomorphic architecture. And he says that liquid architecture is an architecture that breathes, that leaps, pulses as one forms and lands as another. So it's an architecture that opens to welcome me and closes to defend me. It's an architecture without, without doors and hallways. So it's an architecture that is maybe more like an atmosphere. It's liquid. Um, I'd love to give the word maybe now to Abdel Kader. You started from this um, for your exhibition. <coughs> yes. Uh, well, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for this two <laughs> big creators <laughs> surrounding me <laughs> and thank you for the Triennale for this invitation and also for the invitation in this uh, church to do this, this exhibition. Uh, of course the challenge to do an exhibition here in this church is first of all to answer the theme of, of the Triennale Liquid City but also to answer with an inside exhibition to an outdoor exhibition. So we have two kinds of exhibitions here in, in the same time. You have an outdoor uh, exhibition with uh, architecture or pieces that, are the, that act in the city as architecture because you can use them as you use architecture. And you have here inside pieces that Perhaps one of them you can use, you can enter inside, but the other ones you need to see them from a distance. And this is, uh, in my point of view, this was a challenge, how to combine all this. And also the challenge is this architecture. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, uh, exhibiting architecture or creating architecture is what all human beings do every day life. So you wake up the morning and you be became a curator of architecture. The way you walk in architecture and you decide to go this way or this other way is a way of creating architecture because in fact you are changing the narrative of architecture. 
And this is what is absolutely fascinating in this discipline, is that architecture, um, differently from the other arts uh, disciplines, architecture is a sort of returnal, but a permanent returnal between fiction, fiction and reality. And this returnal began to turn and to create this confusion between uh, reality and fiction when the public, when the people act inside. So how to create something that is all the time in movement, <laughs> etc. So you need to reduce the, the, the architecture to something that I call the original architecture. Because my statement in the museum where I work and with the collection we have is to consider that the architecture, the built architecture is just a copy of the original architecture, which is the drawing of the architect. And usually the copy of this drawing is not well done. The building is all the time something very different from the drawing, from the earliest drawing. So you need to come back to this, to this uh, meaning of architecture and try to build something where you have the pieces inside the space, but in the same time you have, in a way, the, um, this architecture to challenge. Uh, we are in a Baroque space mm -hmm. and uh, we have in our uh, uh, collection a piece from Bernard Cash with the group named Objectil. So it's, well, it's the piece there on the right. So perhaps we can, it's after we can have the two, we can walk around. We can walk around. Yeah. And Objectil is, is a word used by Gilles Deleuze in his. Uh, book about Leibniz and about Baroque uh, period, and uh, he, 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 he talked about this object as the age of the fault going to infinity. L'âge du pli qui va à l'infini. So, and all these architectures you have here are about this. How, there are processes that don't uh, stop. So, well, you want me to explain each work? Because I'm going to talk for two hours. No, <laughs> but... <laughs> but it's good, it's good. I think maybe... So, so maybe perhaps, in some perhaps group, just... Like, for example, mm. the one in the middle there, it's called, what's the name again? Mark Fornes. Mark Fornes. Mani, am I saying it correct like that? Yes, this is the... His, the Tivori Mani. This is the name of his uh, office. It looks like it's almost really going into dialogue with this kind of architecture? Yes, because it's in, uh, in, in a way it's a sort of uh, uh, amorph, it's not a form. No. And this is exactly what all these movements are about. Is you walk around the exhibition, you will find, for example, the Yonel Shine plastic home that you can build yourself and transport if you want. In front of this, you have also the Guardiola House of Peter Eisenman, which is a non-house because it has no relation to what we usually understand and see like a house. And this is something that you can't name. And if you have a name for this, please tell me. What is this? Is this architecture? Of course, we, we, uh, we call this a prototype. Uh, but this is uh, just to, to have it in the collection. We have a prototypes also in collection because we have drawing, etc. But if you go deeply to understand exactly this piece, what is this about? Is this architecture? We can say yes because we can enter inside, but we can stay inside. It, it doesn't, uh, the, the quote of Novak, there is just one word where, where I'm not, I disagree with him. Mm -hmm. uh, when he says that uh, this architecture defend him, all these movements are not about an architect that defend you. It's an architecture that uh, um, bring a sort of continuity between the outside and the inside. So it's not about uh, creating new limits or uh, separate you from, from, from outside. So you can't uh, call it architecture, you can't call it scul uh, just a sculpture. So, and this is uh, what is very important. Of course, this was produced by computation with a script and introducing the word, this word of a script, this is uh, something very important also to understand all this architect is that at what, and, uh, at what one time, in fact in the early 60s, because from 1962 architects 
were using a computer in the MIT, uh, in Madrid, in, in different parts of the world. So it begins very early uh, in, in the history of, of the 20th century. Uh, so the script it changes something very fundamental in architecture, which is uh, that there is no more drawing. Architects don't want to draw, they script. So they write. And all this architecture is more like a text than like a drawing and a form. And of course, this is why this text can go um, more long, you can continue this, this text in everywhere, in everyone. But it is also a very, 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 uh, from my point of view, a very erotic piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, it remembers me also all the time one sentence from Georges Bataille. I don't know if you, uh, a lot of people read Georges Bataille in his book about erotism, where he talks about sexuality as uh, the nostalgia of a moment of uh, disequilibrium. Uh, we say it in English, uh, disequilibrium. Yeah. So, uh, the nostalgia of a moment of disequilibrium. So, this piece is the nostalgia of a moment of disequilibrium. So, it doesn't, it is no more the monolith of the modern architecture. So, and, uh, well, I'm going to stop. If not, I'm going Could to you do not also say that. That's actually an interesting thing yeah. that you are mentioning because you say, okay, it's the scripture replaces the scribble. Yeah. yeah in a way, then, of course, you know, compared to other artists, um, sculptors and painters, architectures always had greatest difficulties in holding the ink. Huh? So it starts with, uh, with Serlio and with, uh, with Alberti. They have been all over the place. They have been writing theoretical treatises, you know, and everyone else remained silent you know, about the architects, they go and they write manifests one manifest after the other. And um, of course, it's kind of an interesting thought that now, sort of like, you know, uh, the, 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 um, the mediation between the idea and the execution sort of like is diminished, eh? sort of mm -hmm. the idea. We had that, uh, we had last week, there was a small meeting about uh, the restoration of the Ghent altarpiece. And apparently now there are a couple of um, uh, people at the VUB uh, busy with uh, algorithms that essentially could lead to automated, automated restoration, you know, because they're studying crack patterns. So there is this idea of like, you know, we're making us, ourselves completely redundant in our way, which is, you know, good because obviously with the global warming, we won't be there forever. So good that the computers are still uh, able to, to maintain themselves. But it's sort of like, it is an interesting idea because the immediacy of the execution, I think, is, is something which, uh, which is... Um, <laughs> what I wanted to say, in fact, was that the immediacy of the, uh, you know, you lose the, the mediation. The architect has an idea, he draws it, and this drawing goes to somebody who's actually executing it. So you have, like, different people sort of, like, in the process of realizing the idea. Now, this step has been potentially illumin uh, eliminated, by the introduction of, um, of technical aids, um, an algorithm which allows the architect to actually computerize the entire process, which is of course very fascinating. And it yields um, yeah, a variety, and you see sort of the variety of, um, of, um, of results that are yeah, in a way very, very fascinating. So, so um, Michelle, uh, you wanted to ask a question. Well, okay. Uh, yeah. As you said, I'm not an architect, I'm an art historian, and I came to Markus Novak completely by accident. It was, in fact, visual artists uh, was creating an, an exhibition at the end of the 90s, and they were fascinated by blob architecture, uh, and Greg Lynn was one of the names of with, with which came back all the time, so for me that was uh, quite unknown. I, I'm talking about the end of the 90s, and there this guy showed me a book and Marcus Novak was in there, I found this fascinating, and also his text about liquid architecture and liquid city. He also uses, I think, for one of the first yes. people, not Baumann, but he, in 1991, uses for the first time, I think, liquid city. I find this fascinating uh, architecture. Uh, he was talking about transcending the architectural body, the, the transcending the materiality, going to cyberspace. When I look back to this, again, I'm not an architect, I look at this from from an outside position, 
um, it's fascinating, yes, and as you said, this hope, this wish to transform the world, to transform architecture, but also to improve the world through technology, through technological advancements, through the cyber world. Now, it's, it's, for me, it's what is the responsibility of the architect? What is the responsibility of the urbanists? It's not these dreams anymore. And again, even though I was fascinated by these designs, absolutely, of the 90s, it looks like, again, the idea that technology will save the world, whereas I am very much influenced by Bruno Latour, for example, mm -hmm. or Donna Haraway, and more in this kind of thinking, we need a different responsible architecture, a different responsible um, urbanism, not into cyberspace, but into our own reality and there to try to change things, perhaps through cyberspace, to, perhaps to try to use it as a techno technological device, but not to dream outside this some kind of parallel world, a parallel world. So this is, this is my answer. Uh, what is your look now? If you look back at the 90s, was this not again a naive idea of a faith in technological advancement and improving the world through architecture, digital architecture? Well, in fact, you asked me to critique my collection. <laughs> I'm going to do this, just because, <laughs> well, uh, we need to understand what is architecture about and uh, what is our hope, in fact. So I have a small idea uh, that I bring all the time in the discussion, is that there is a shared hope of paradise for all people around the world. We hope paradise. But in fact, when you study paradise, paradise is the only space where you don't need architecture. <laughs> paradise is a land without architecture. So paradise is the only space where architecture disappears. And this explains why from about one century, the critique of the modernism, the critique of the monolith and the, this uh, way uh, group of architects, the early group of architects, the radical architects in Italy like Superstudio or Riccardo D'Alisi, the, the, uh, the, the, the group like Archigram, Archizum, etc., all these groups, their crit critique were to broke the monolith. And through breaking the monolith, they were changing one of the most important things in, in architecture, which is that architecture fight against gravity. This is exactly what architecture do. If this building don't fight against gravity, we are going to receive this upon our, our heads. So this is the first thing that architecture do. Architecture build things and resist to gravity. And to broke the monolith, you need to accept that you don't need more to resist to the gravity, but you accept to go down. And this was the tentative, for example, of Superstudio with their monument continue. This was all these architects trying to build this form of uh, this new way of doing architecture, bringing us to Hans uh, Olein with this uh, manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> he did saying that all things is architecture. The way I'm standing in front of you, I am doing architecture. The way I talk, I'm doing architecture. When I sleep, I'm doing architecture. Architecture is the whole thing in life. It's not just about building. It's not just about building. And this is why now we have different kind of architect. Perhaps 80% of the architects who get their diploma don't work as classic architect. They are doing something else with architecture. This is the reality of, of now. Of course, I am also critical about what happens during the 90s because during the 90s what was happening is an idea developed, well, I am I'm missing the name, but what, they were in experience in 1977 uh, in Berlin, West Berlin, to consider all the city as an exhibition. So the building were considered as art pieces and the wall separating the two parts of Berlin as like a sort of big gallery. And uh, they developed a lot this idea that the city can be sort of uh, 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 full museum with just art pieces, etc. But of course, in the 90s, they tried to transform the building not no more as a building, but as uh, what uh, Deleuze uh, called the objectile. And the objectile is not an object. 
It's something that is usually in movement, permanently in movement. And of course, what we need now in the real world, if you want an answer to this question, we don't need no more architects that build, because uh, perhaps this sentence is quite unbelievable, but I don't believe that we need uh, architect that built. We need the architect now that can reuse what have been built. This is one of the big challenge. We don't have enough space now to build more. So what we need is architect that reuse what have been already built. What we need now is also architect that can receive what's coming from the world. We have a world changing every time. In a week, uh, some uh, countries can disappear. Uh, in, in, is that what you mean with this a priori architecture? Somehow returning to some kind of an original? Uh, a priori architecture, he wrote? Uh, well, the... the, the, the uh, <laughs> no, just the... the, the uh, from my point of view, when an architect designs a building, he is rewriting all the history of architecture. If you don't consider that his building is a rewriting of all the history of architecture, then he is not doing an architecture. And architects try every time to rethink the origin of architecture. This is what architects do. Because a wall is all the time the same wall. It's the same partition, it's the same thing. So why this wall is different from another one? So, but when you, you consider as an architect yourself that you are in a continuity in history of architecture and you have to rebuild something that has been built before, so you, have, you need to rewrite this history of architecture. This is why the Guardiola House of Peter Eisenman is so powerful. Because the Guardiola House of Peter Eisenman rewrites what is a house. And when you look to these drawings of uh, the house, you don't recognize the house. You don't understand what's happening. And this is wh wh why he is so great architect. Zadid with her drawing with the spiral house is the same thing. So how architect can rewrite history of architecture with every building? Of course, all the architects don't do this. But well, this is the real world. Till and Michelle, um, Michelle, you talked about this uh, dream of architecture, or at least the idea that architecture can change cities, can change our society, this dream of the 90s. Is that some, something that maybe you're trying to do here in Bruges with all these injections of, of architecture everywhere? Mm -hmm. You asked me the question. <laughs> I asked you the question and also Jill if you want. I can, I can. I think, I think there is a misconception in that sense that the idea of um, the that architecture has a function that is beyond aesthetics is something which is actually much older. If you look back, I mean, do you think that Gropius or uh, you know uh, Mies and Le Corbusier didn't think about changing uh, the world to a better, making making uh, architecture to make uh, the world a better place? I think then then you know. The, the utopian idea of the architect has always been the same, but the reactions are different. And if you're talking about drawings or whatever, then think about Mendelssohn, who is of course a fantastic uh, uh, draughtsman uh, of the expressionist, uh, expressionist uh, architecture, which of course is something which in the 90s comes up again. You know, but you know we have lived through the 90s. So I can tell you that was um, it was fun. In fact, it was fun. And um, and uh, all of a sudden, sort of like the. Um, yeah, at least that's how it felt to, to me, uh, uh, the idea of sort of like an almost um, dogmatic manner of architecture in the post-Bauhaus uh, ideology was all of a sudden lifted and all these crazy people came around and they started to use colors and to, you know, Sterling. Remember Sterling? Yes. I mean, all this crazy shit started to happen and, and all of, everything went, you know, bananas and not in Bruges. <laughs> uh, not in Bruges, but at that point, uh, at that point in Bruges, one has to give that to them. They were uh, actually at the very same time very much concerned in in uh, containing the space and actually assure that the city as such would not change entirely in its structure. And you know, um, 
you probably know me now that I, I, I think critically about that, but again, lucky they did do that because otherwise we would look at a different space right now. And of course, I mean, this is the best example of how and it, it's going about recycling. I mean, when, when Michel and uh, Abdel Kadir started to work in this building and to started to bring the um, collection of the track or parts of the collection of the track here. I was just unloading the crates. You were, <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, honestly speaking, this is such a um, substantial part of the aesthetic experience that you can have during the triennial. That is, I mean, excuse me, I mean, these are incredible pieces here, um, which, which live because of the environment which they are built in. Now, this is not, this is not Bernini, and this is not uh, you know, but it's still it's a it's a it's a it's a very interesting building because of sort of the the change between sort of like the Baroque to the neoclassicist uh, area. So there are Baroque elements here, but it's really sort of like almost guess a classicistic touch, which is of course precisely what happened in Bruges, but also determined the, the city. And now we're getting really exciting architecture here, and and this is as far as I'm concerned, one of the most exciting ways to, to, to think about heritage in this city uh, that, that can be used. Also because actually it will disappear. So we will not have you know, this material on our legs for the next hundred years. It will disappear and other things can come and so it can remain a dynamic space. To answer your question, um, the idea for the China comes from the mayor. And one of the, I remember this in 2013, one of the first things he said, the city is the main protagonist of the exhibition. It's like a, it's like a player. It's like the central player. You are in ba basically you are on a stage in a bühne, mm -hmm. a theatre stage. Uh, and what fascinates me immediately is that Bruges, basically, because of decisions taken in the 19th century by certain mayors, second part of the of the, of the 19th century, has more or less stayed. Or they wanted to keep what was there, but they also changed a number of things to fit a certain desired image from the past. So it's a kind of desired space. If you talk about uh, La Production de l'Espace by Henri Lefebvre, um, famous French thinker, how that certain um, power structures, certain political structures are able, are all producing their own spatial logic. And you see this in the occupation, the transformation of space. This is a beautiful example of this, of certain decisions which were taken, which were also, I think, quite anti-modernist because the, in the industrial waves were hitting, of course, Belgium, but this, this kind of industrialization of the, of the industrial movements were not really apparent in Bruges. People, really, certain political powers searched for, we stop here, we have a certain stage. We don't name them, sir. <laughs> no, no, but, I mean, this is interesting. In other cities, you don't have this kind of, you have certain protected places, certain protected spaces, of course. But this kind of museum city, you have to go to Venice. Venice is another example, or Carcassonne, perhaps, which has also been reconstructed to a certain idea. When, when you ask certain questions about contemporary architecture or, or contemporary culture, I think, I, I think you can uh, ask them in a way much sharper here than in other environments where modernity has a far bigger impact. And, um, we all know that Bruges, certainly in Belgium, receives some criticism. Eh? I mean, it's the Gothic or Neo-Gothic Bokrek, it's Neo-Gothic Disneyland. And Jan Gale, who is a quite famous urbanist, said, yes, but through the choices that were made in the 19th century, second half of the 19th century, by these political parties, you have a livable city on human scale. You mean the 20th century? Yes. No, no, yeah. I mean, the mayors took in the second half of the 19th century. Okay, already then not to go along with forms of modernization. Mm -hmm. huh? I lived in Brussels, I live in Antwerp and in Ghent, I can tell you, there you see the houseman, uh, the housemanization, for example. In Bruges, you have one street, only one, mm -hmm. where there are proof of, of, of house housemanization, only one. I mean, in Brussels, they put highways in the middle of the street, in the middle of, of, of town. So this kind of uh, evolution has been stopped. You can be for it, you can be against it, you can call it conservative or not. And young Gale said, but why do you complain? You can walk in the city, it's a city on human scale, because of those decisions in the 19th century. And then, if you put some in this space which was constructed, according to Lefebvre, on certain ideological basis, there you can, I think, on a temporary basis, ask some interesting questions that perhaps in other cities where this modernization is so much more clear, will be less apparent. 
and that is one of my uh, one of the things that I like about this uh, about this project. Perhaps you can ask here sharper questions than in other cities. By the way, did I say anything interesting? Or no? Yes. <laughs> Let me ask something else because I think uh, with Abdel Kadir Damani, we do have uh, we do have a colleague here who's been sort of like, of course, you know, the flag. Whoever uh, goes to manages to pass the traffic jams of the uh, outer ring of Paris and finds himself on the way to the Loire, it's definitely a must to stop there and uh, look at the amazing. I mean, there is no other word, amazing collection uh, that uh, that the flag owns. But, um, you know, there is that, and there is, of course, putting the collection at work, if you want to. And I think um, and that's why, why, why I was uh, actually rather, rather interested to see how, <coughs> how you feel about curating architecture. You know, that's, of course, you know, something, I'm, I'm a, I'm a two-dimensional two guy, you know, I think. At the moment that we go in the third dimension, my intellectualism doesn't work. But, uh, I mean, curating, curating architecture is something which is... Um, Special. So tell tell us about a little bit about your history. Then. He's taking over. Well, the I, I, I'm not going to tell the truth or the truth, but I'm going to try to answer your question. Of, of course, uh, creating architecture as a paradox is something. Uh, it's really an old debate. How you create architecture if you use architecture? In fact, before the white cube. All the, 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 the exhibitions of the two dimensions that you like so much of paintings were challenging to create architecture. If you don't have the white cube and you display paintings in an architecture which is not a white cube, you are do creating your painting exhibition, but you are on the same time creating architecture because you are bringing a new way of looking to architecture and seeing architecture. Of course, from the 60s, the white cube protect us from architecture and give us the possibility just to, to do our exhibition with no matter how, what the architecture is. So, in, in, the, in, the, in the other hand, uh, creating architecture needs to uh, I think we need to have in mind the three, three, three topics. The first one is the responsibility of creating architecture. Uh, creating architecture, we have a responsibility in, in, against the public, uh, because uh, showing architecture is showing a political art. Architecture is not just for, uh, about aesthetic. It's, we can say it's uh, quoting uh, Jacques Rancière, uh, aesthetic et politique, so it's both politic and aesthetic, but this is what architecture is for. If you decide to stop the growth of a city, this is a political decision about uh, identity, about the image you want to give of yourself. So it's not just about protecting uh, the, the patrimonium. So this is the first responsibility of creating architecture. The second thing is that when you create architecture, in fact, you, I, in my experience, I try to create research in architecture because architects don't have this space to show what they don't build. In fact, you have in the practice of an architect what he's doing for living, what he's doing for building, but an architect is in all his life building a research, building, trying to discover things, trying to, to understand things. And the exhibition can be the space where the research of architect, the experimentation of architect can be, can be used. And the third thing, the third thing you, we, 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 we need to think about when we create architecture is the value you give to the object. Of course, there is like, you appear like sort of ready-made, because when you give the model, the model which is uh, something to just make the demonstration that the building can be built, but you give to this model the, the, the value of an art piece, putting the, this uh, uh, exhibited as an artwork, protected with the distance, etc. So you are making a very, very big difference. And of course, in the museum I'm leading, all the models are uh, art pieces for us. The drawing of an architect is an art piece. Of course, now we have some new problems with the script I'm collecting, for example, from the 1960s. There are just 
printing from the printing things from the computer. But in the same time, some printings are from 1968 to 1967, the first printing, the first research of an architect. So they have also the value of this new kind of drawing architecture, writing architecture. So you need to make all this kind of decision to understand that you are creating architecture. And the last thing is that the building where you create the architecture is part of the creating, is part of the exhibition, as I think you are doing with, with, uh, uh, with the Triennale here in, in Bruges. Uh, but I have a question because, uh, about your Triennale. <laughs> because uh, I did one time a study about Le Couvent de la Tourette de Le Corbusier. And I tried to see all the photographs who photographs uh, all the photos of the Couvent de la Tourette, from the opening to the 90s. All the photographs for, uh, take picture of the same spaces. The, ex the, the architecture of Le Corbusier resists to photos. The, uh, it's, it's so beautiful and so strong that it tells you where <laughs> you take your picture, where you frame it, where you take it, etc. And all the photos are the same. I am thinking about something that when I walk around the, the, all the spaces here in, 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 the, in Bruges about the Triennale, over the time I recognize that, well, they can't be in another part of the city. They need to be here because the city, as it designed it, uh, give you the spaces where you can display things. Of course, sometimes you try to go out of this uh, uh, phenomenon, but. Uh, uh, it's, it's so we can't create our uh, architecture without the, re the real world, without the real city, because and without the real building. For example, the fornes is there because it can't be in, in another space. And the, this, from the first time I visited this church, and I saw, of course, <laughs> this this perspective, and I had in mind this bloom game, and I said, "Come on, this is exactly the space for for this piece." Because, of course, there is an ambiguity here. Why did, did I create this here in front of, of this part of the, of the church? But, well, it, it, fits, it fits there because, it fits there because it's, this piece is, uh, well, let, because I am the director, so I can touch the piece. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So, the, 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 this, this, this architecture, or this sculpture, or this art piece, is just this. So it's just this. Just this. Three, three parts where you can combine, and you do the form you want. And the Bloom game, the two architects working on this, uh, were asked in, during the Olympic game in, in, in England to create a garden, a public garden, and they decided to create something collaborative garden. So they create a process through computational architecture, because you need uh, the computer to design this and to understand all the combination you can do. But after that, to use it, you need to come back to the earliest age of building architecture. You need people, you need hands to uh, put them together. Of course, we, we decided the, the, the form like this, but you can do another form if you want, an, another way of doing things. And of course, uh, I believe that this is architecture. You, you, you can't live inside, but it is also architecture because it's, it gives value to the way you are going to understand the space, the way you are going to, to to react to the space. And all the pieces you have here in, in, in the Triennale act in the same way. When you are in front of any piece here in the Triennale, of course you look to the piece, but I experimented this today. Go into the piece and try to see uh, Bruges, <laughs> because it is, it, is, <laughs> it is the purpose of, of, of this, uh, this piece. Is that, and the, this, uh, the, this idea of giving the public the conscience of the real world where they live, this is the responsibility of creating architecture, in my point of view. 
Okay, I'm going to bring for for the good order for those of you who are guiding around. We would appreciate if you don't follow this example. <laughs> <to> <laughs> No, but I think from the from the from the, um, from the curatorial point when it comes to the training, I think um, you know we 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 always had the idea that I mean the idea of using Bruges as a background and why do you do it because it's Bruges? I think that that would be I think Michel uh, sort of like selling the idea short, even uh, the, the the ideas that uh, that that the, that may have brought about. It was about trying to really. bring contemporary art in the center, in the hearts, if you want to, of the people and see what happens. Uh, and and uh, for me, it's still one of the most interesting parts, and I'm really a big fan of ephemeral architecture, uh, is the fact that, uh, you know, in, in a couple of months, everything will be gone. But it's not in the memory. It's the spaces will remain there in the memory. And that's, that's an important thing, you know. And in a way, it's yeah. The memory is positive as well, as if it would be staying there for like years and years and years and years before it's dismantled and, and brought to Seebrugge, where it leads a second life. For me, one of the strongest architectural ideas is Rotor, the Brussels architects who discovered all these crabs. Is it a building? Of course not. I mean, not in the classical, but the, I mean, the awareness of space and the awareness of who lives. Or, which animal lives in this space day in, day out with us, that the city is not only a city of the Homo sapiens, but of thousands and thousands of other creatures. And what can you do with this? All the relationships, cooking it, for example, eating it, uh, respecting it, um, changing your awareness of your own space, that you actually live in Northern Europe with a Chinese, with hundreds of thousands of Chinese in, uh, immigrants, basically is, I find, an extremely potent idea to, to go back to Alice's architecture von Hans Orlein. I don't know if he was into crabs, but uh, <laughs> I find it's a very interesting idea. Raumleibung as well, they kind of did very small interventions together with it's, people. It, it's quite big, actually. It's quite big. You mean Raumleibung? Yes. Yeah. But that, that, that in itself is another. They were early on on the radar and, um, and we have been in a way um, Again, you know, the idea that um, yeah, all, the, all the people aligned to the necessity to, to have a kind of creative intervention to, um, to bring people together in a specific um, group of uh, people in Bruges, uh, to bring them together, to actually expose them. Um, that is sort of like people, uh, young, younger people without uh, uh, a steady position or with problems at school and stuff like that and I must say to me it's one of the most heartwarming things because it's sort of a living organism that is created and um, and you see the enthusiasm of the young people the enthusiasm of the professionals who are hired by the city to um, to accompany the young people to help them and the architects who are, who are I have to say, you know, they are my age, which is a kind of embarrassing. It tells a lot about myself and my age, aging process. But, um, and, but you know, really sort of like bringing bringing new ideas and a good vibe to the city, uh, to that space. It's, it's, I think, personally one of the most exciting spaces that we have at the current moment. Well, here, here we come, and uh, Mr. Damani will certainly react to this. We come to the curatorial choices. I, I think you will say that Home Labor has many pre. Three earlier architects who were busy with the bottom-up and social projects, but before you, before you answer, <laughs> I mean, um, we really put Ram Labor on there because they do this bottom-up project since the 90s, the late 90s, uh, in Berlin. Um, they work, they, they are not into the building of constructions, it's far more analysis of situations. Um, the architect is a kind of social agent, a cultural agent, which brings pe people together. The creating counters. Yes, the creating counters. counters. It's modulating space, but all forms of spaces. Uh, and bringing literally people together, not only the builders of impressive uh, buildings. Remteveld, like the Belgians, are also uh, starting out to do that. Are starting out to do this in the same vein. Uh, well, no, no, I, I'm, go I'm not going to say it. <laughs> to say it. Uh, no, j j just to... to 
perhaps to bring to the discussion the, 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 the text of uh, Reinhard Banam, a home is not a house. And where, where he just, uh, the, 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 the key is very, very simple. Uh, we have a lot of myth of the beginning of the architecture. One of them is the ut, you know, the, the first thing. Uh, but the second one is the fire. Human being used to just to, to do a fire and to be around. So where is the house? Is to have the fire and to be around or to build the hut? So the, the, you, you, you need to, to, to at four Rainer Banam when he did his, his text, uh, uh, home is not a house, he decided this. And we have this beautiful Dalegri drawing in my collection. <laughs> <laughs> so this beautiful uh, drawing of Dalegri where it's a, a, a transparent bubble where you have uh, Dalegri and Banam naked just uh, inside of this of this bubble and enjoying this new kind of uh, architecture so uh, th th this is why uh, Raum Leber Berlin uh, are doing architecture without building uh, of course architecture is not architecture building construction are not synonyms th 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 they are a word that can complete each other but they are not synonyms so, so we can't say that architecture is uh, is building. It's not the same. Thing. There is a lot of building done without architecture, and a lot of great architecture never built. And there is a lot of great architecture never built. And one of the most beautiful exhibition we had in the MoMA was architecture without architect. With uh, so, 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 so just to try to not to bring the discipline of architecture just through building. Architect is more complex thing. Because it's a more responsibility. So, so but what is the difference between architecture and sculpture? Ah, <laughs> architecture and sculpture. Perhaps it's the way you use uh, the, 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 each one of them. But what is sculpture? Because Dan Graham, his pavilions are seen yeah. as sculptures. And I'm but sorry, I see them as architecture. Too. I told him too. a lot of times. So, yeah, you are doing architecture, but. Uh, it's more easy to do to do sculpture because you have too many laws <laughs> yeah. with, with architecture. You, you have to, to, too many laws, too many things to do. You but if you are, that much. Yes. you don't have to write a manifesto. So that's already something. You, uh, po you pointed out before Abdel Kader that um, Joseph Gosset at the Biennale. Oh, yeah, he, he said, said this. Uh, architecture is the most political art because it's made for a purpose. It reflects a culture. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Yes. Yes. Say that to Luc Thurmans and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what architecture is, is, is for. So I don't know, but when uh, the, the decision to have a pyramid in the Louvre is not just, to, it's not just a joke. <coughs> it's to, to bring one of uh, the, the most oldest souvenir we have about what is architecture in, 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 inside Paris. Of course, in the beginning, it was a nightmare because no one wants this, this pyramid. But it was absolutely a brilliant uh, idea of... Uh, you, could, you could argue it was also a very problematic idea because yes. it referred to, of course, colonialism <laughs> and all that. Yes. And sort of like there are layers of, you know... Yes. Of, uh, <clears throat> but you, you talk about colonialism. Well, I come from Algeria and we have this debate in, in Algeria. What we do with the colonialist uh, architecture? The, the, the French architecture. All Algiers, the big part of Algiers, were, were built by the, 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 the by French. So after the, 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 the freedom in 1962, this was a very big debate. And when I was in Algeria, we didn't know exactly what to do about this because you can't consider that the urbanism of Algiers is bad because it was well done. The architecture from Art Deco are beautiful, but you can't say beautiful to something that colonizes you. So it's, 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 it's something very difficult. And I'm going to tell you just one story about what's happening in Algiers because it's very, very strange. When you are in Algiers, in the center of Algiers, just close to one building, big building we call La Poste, so the, and it just close to this, you have a monument to the revolution. So a big monument, you know, big uh, communist one, you know, white, 
with all the images of uh, people who fight for, for, uh, for, for the freedom of Algeria. In fact, this building, this sculpture, this big monument, have inside of it another monument, the monument of the French people during the colonialism. <laughs> during the colonialism, in the, in the early of the 19th, 20th century, France built uh, a series of sculptures where you have uh, a man walking to the south. I mean, it's all the time like this, walking to the south, so, uh, building the, 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 colonial, the colonial area. So it was there, this was the monument of France. And during the independence after the 60s, the president asked an artist to destroy this build, this sculpture, and to build a new one for the memory of Algerian Martins. But the guy was an artist, and he can't destroy the work of another artist. So he decided <laughs> to build a new monument to protect the other one and to hide it. And still to now you have two monuments, one inside the other one, two memories, one inside the other one. So this gives you the, 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 the big importance of uh, the, the, the architecture as a, a political decision. It's not something very easy to, to, to deal with. Uh, we saw this, for example, with uh, the jungle in Calais. You know that yeah. in the jungle in Calais, they built three schools, uh, one mosque, two church, uh, one synagogue, uh, three restaurants, two hotels in the jungle of uh, okay. they, have, they, they have built all these things, all these things. It was really a city and it was a real performance because it was the performance uh, where we could see exactly how we can react in urbanism and architecture in the most critique situation. But we decided to destroy it because we can't accept this kind of, ima of image. Uh, well, we, uh, and I talked a lot with a group uh, called Le Pérou uh, in France who are philosophers, architects, artists who worked a lot in, in, in the jungle of Calais doing drawings, sketches, uh, uh, photographs of all what happens. And we talked about bringing all this material as part of the collection. So to recognize what happens in Calais as an experimentation of architecture with the same value of the experimentation of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s. And they accept and we are doing this. So to bring this, uh, the, the, what happens in, in, in Calais, so in the real world, as you, you, you say, because this is the real world. Yes. Of course, Bruges is also a beautiful real world, but it's a small real world. The other, <laughs> the big part of the inner world is getting more close to Calais than to Bruges. And that is where history repeats itself, huh? Yes. <laughs> because as you all remember from the history lessons, when Calais was still under English occupants in the Hundred Years' War, the situation around that with the French army trying to occupy, that was pretty much the same as in the jungle. <laughs> and many people died because of the same reasons. If, I, 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 if I may answer Mr. Kozut to be <laughs> even more difficult. Yes, architecture and urbanism reflect certain political, ideological ideas, but if you listen to what Mr. Damana and Till says, it's the, literally the production of politics. It produces politics in space. Yes. Does it? It's, yes, it's more, it? it's, it's more than just a reflection. It's, it's literally part of this narration. It's more than an image. It's literally the policy, I think. Is there, is there something, is there, the, is there the possibility of a political architecture? Ah, yes, uh, not doing architecture. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I know sort of like a lot of <laughs> architects, you know, they have it. And there are always connotations. Is that something which is inherent to the architecture? Is it inherent to the way that we are sort of um, perceiving it? Is it, you know, it, well, let's put it the other way around. I think sort of like um, when, what? No, 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 let's go. <laughs> when, um, when um, you know, big urbanistic, of course, you know, when, when they built, uh, you know, the, the Mont des Arts in, in, in Brussels, so that was a political statement. But it seems like almost people were not aware of what kind of political statement they were doing at that point, you know. 
And um, Renato Nicolori, apparently he sort of like is making artworks using architectural forms which are, you know, uh, using political language in a way. But, you know, it's, it's, but it doesn't seem to be necessarily aware of that. You know what I mean? So there is that. I'm, I'm not sure about that, if it always has to be political. Or it's sort of like, you know. But I think you first. Yeah, no, 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 please. Go I ahead. think you have to define then what is politics. Uh, here I will follow Chantal Mouffe, uh, Chantal Mouffe uh, who says then that any human act, but also any artwork and any architecture has always, whether you want it or not, a political dimension or is part of a political dimension, is either an acceptance of a certain political idea or a criticism. Even if you, I mean, I, I remember um, one of the examples of the wonderful examples that Mouffe gave was the so-called um, were the exhibitions of the 50s of American abstract art, so-called non-political art, huh, or, or art without any political content, which was sponsored, for example, by the CIA in different countries in Europe to promote the liberty and the freedom of. Um, the United States. So it's not because there's not a political theme, apparent political theme on an abstract white line, for example, that it's not political, that it's not within a political framework or within a political dimension. So I think there is, this, you're always, for me, within some set of political space, whether you like it or not, even though they try to escape it. But then, but then you're talking about a mechanism around it, right? For me, that's a useless discussion. That's for me. P perhaps we need to separate just two kinds of architecture. You have what we call paper architecture. And there were a movement in uh, uh, called paper architecture, but in paper architecture you have uh, Akigram is paper architecture. All this utopian prospective experimental architecture who were doing architecture in paper, not because they don't want to build, but they want to think first about what is architecture. So then, they can be, uh, they are all the time politic because uh, they, they try to change definitely the image we have about the city. For example, instant city of Peter Cook, it's a big change about what means the city. Of course, now all the cities are instant cities uh, because uh, the, 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 we, are, we, are, we are living in a permanent event, 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 event world. It's no more the real world, it's a, a world of uh, uh, events every time, every day, every day, every time. And of course here in Bruges you have the perfect example of, of this. Uh, I was talking with uh, uh, an, an artist from, from, from Bruges and we were talking and he told me, you know this joke we have here in Bruges, I said, what? Uh, we use the joke against the, the, the Japanese tourists who say, at what time the park closed? talking about the city. So the feeling of the reality that became like a permanent event is, this was in the in instant city of Peter Cook, but we find it also in the instant city done by uh, uh, Jose Maria de Prada Pooled in the south of Spain in 1971, etc. So and you have the other part of architecture, which is the built architecture. And in the built architecture, it's not the architect who is acting alone. Alone, He acts also with urbanists. He acts also with the rules of, of the city. He acts with... So an architecture is not just an object that you put somewhere. Sometimes the highest uh, the, of, of your building is a stop it because of not because you don't want to, to make it more high, but it stopped just because uh, you are not permitted to do it like this. So uh, uh, the built architecture is no more just uh, an architect of one architect. And through the history of architecture, the most beautiful buildings we have in the modern architecture were private commission. Uh, Ms. van der Rohe, uh, Wright, uh, Le Corbusier, even Le Corbusier. Le Couvent de la Tourette, uh, are the, the, and not the public one, because the public one, you have all the time this, uh, you need to challenge things, but of course you can find other one, one example, <laughs> one one example is the Barcelona, you know, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Miss Van der Rohe's high rise. 
So you, you, we need to perhaps to make a difference between these two situations of architecture. And we have still now young architects who don't want to build and who want to continue doing paper architecture. And I think they have right to do this and we need to find them spaces for this, we need to exhibit them, we need to... Because architecture needs also this. Perhaps we talk. Maybe. Um, I think we're trying, kind of slowly going towards the end. Maybe two completely different types of questions. I think we would love to hear a little bit more about... Maybe you want to take us around for those who want to stay around for 10 more minutes to the favorites you want to talk about and give us some highlights. But before we do that, maybe a question for you now that the Triennale is here. Uh, do you think <coughs> after they disappeared, and of course it will stay in the minds of people, but will it also go towards the minds of politics and will it change well, things no, here in Bruges? Absolutely. Yeah. I think there is, um, <laughs> this is, uh, to be honest, one of the, yeah, I wouldn't say small miracles, but it's sort of really, um, it, it's very moving to see how this project that we started a couple of years ago, sort of like is now used as a synonym for um, for transforming the city in a, in a positive way. And, um, and it's also political, uh, political, but uh, not necessarily negative that I think everyone has embraced that idea and tries to use it for their own purposes. So, yes, I think that is something which which is embraced, and of course everyone has a different reading about things, but for the moment, when I came here, there was always to talk about the fact, okay, you talk about culture, but please do also talk about culture of the terraces. And I think that has shifted a little bit, a little bit, not too much, but it has. The culture of the terraces? The terraces, the terraces very kind of where you can have it. There are some examples, and Till can tell much more about this, that this triennial was a kind of engine for change. And, uh, maybe you should talk about the Hütte Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> he, he doesn't want to. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, 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 no. no, it's not it's not a secret at all, but I think sort of like it has it has it's ha it has made discussions possible and I'm mm -hmm. a, you know, I don't have to I don't have to beat around the bush. I'm very happy that uh, that some of the people who were also involved in a very Restrictive, uh, you know, approach towards the city, like at least Van and Abid, who I respect greatly, um, you know, that, that it was possible to engage in uh, constructive discussion uh, about uh, about certain things, which I think 10 years or 15 years ago would not would have simply not have been possible. And we are, and, you know, even uh, for someone who has has, has done uh, you know, all his life fought for the protection of. Uh, of the city, uh, sort of is able to 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 link himself into into a discourse, and that's really I think fantastic uh, mm -hmm. and great, and 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 also um, I think means that uh, Bruges Lamour is probably not Lamour, <laughs> <laughs> or if it's Lamour, it's not Lamour. So good. <laughs> I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. We might go around a bit, maybe some of you have some questions. Or you can come closer and we... We hear each other. I do, you can, can hear each other. We can find the heroes. 